Kelly, what are your tips? Listen to Becky. <laughs> <laughs> Do everything Becky says. <laughs> yes, that is that is true for this podcast and life in general. Just what did Becky say? Do that. <laughs> Hi, I'm Julia. I'm Rachel. And I'm Kelly. And this is What You Should Read. The podcast where we should all over our books. Okay, I know we usually start every episode with talking about what we are currently reading, but today is a very exciting day because we found out that Book of the Month just dropped their December choices. And if anyone who listens to this podcast knows we love book of the month and we usually all get books every month. Um, but we thought it would be fun to do a live reaction to the picks. So we haven't looked at them yet. Right. I think Kelly, you said you saw one. I saw one. Mm-hmm. And then you stopped. Yes. You'd be surprised. Yeah. I pulled up the um, website so that I could share my screen, but I like kept the top of the page in my peripheral vision so as not to see what exactly the book was. So I I don't know either. Great. So pretty much you're going to be getting our live, unfiltered, unedited (laughs) reaction to the options and we'll see how it goes. Great. All right. So for those of you on YouTube, I'm about to share my screen. This is exciting. Uh, I know. We should have been doing this the whole time. Yes. Ooh. Okay. Okay. Hmm. So the first pick is This Close to Okay by Lessa Cross Smith. I don't know this author, but this is an early release and it's a contemporary fiction. And it says a near tragedy brings two lonely strangers who might just have the ability to save each other's lives. Interesting. Okay. Should we open it up for a bigger explanation or go through them all first and then... I think we should do like our reactions just to this alone. Okay. Like your first thoughts. Like, okay. is this a book that you would pick up just based on that? I mean, it sounds very intriguing. I like, um, I like contemporary fiction. I read a lot of it. And um, the, the thing about strangers being able to save each other's lives sounds mm-hmm. very curious to me. And I like that. It sounds good to me, too. Um, I would definitely want to know a little more about it. Um, like, what is the near tragedy? <laughs> is is this, like, a love story? Or right. do they just become friends? Or, like, you know, the kind of friends that are more like family? Um, basically... I I would definitely be interested, but it would depend on how heavy it is because I don't think I can do heavy right now. Right. I have a guess that this book has something to do with an organ donation. (gasps) That's my guess about like how they could save each other's lives. But I would definitely want to know more about it before I make it my book of the month. But it's definitely intriguing. I do like contemporary fiction and I like that cover. Yeah, the cover is very cool. It's, um, I guess, the two main characters, a man and a woman, it looks like. Uh, He looks like he's white. She looks like she might be black or biracial. um, And they're kind Mm -hmm. of staring down in a sad, forlorn, pensive way. But the colors are very um, nice. There's like a blue and a yellow. Yeah, it's pretty. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's pick one. This Close to Okay by Lisa Cross Smith. Okay. Book number two. <gasps> no oh, way. This is the one I saw. This is the one I saw. Uh, okay. okay. So oh. it is a romance. It's in a holidays by Christina Lauren. And the summer. Oh, Julie is so happy. I hope you're watching this on YouTube because this is the happiest I have ever seen her. And I've known her for what feels like my entire life. <laughs> uh, it's okay. true. Uh, so summary is. A woman in the pursuit of happiness is caught up at, or is caught in a time loop in this holiday rom-com brimming with yuletide cheer. And if there is ever a book more perfect for Julia and Rachel, I don't know what it is. <laughs> I Okay, I have this on Kindle, but I did get a NetGalley early copy and I'm really bad NetGalley 
getter because I haven't read it yet, but I fully intend to. And I think I'm going to buy it and make it my book of the month because I feel guilty that I didn't read it in advance. <laughs> like I was supposed <laughs> to and review it. I yeah. still will review it, but I'm definitely, I mean, this is going in my box for sure. Cause I want a hard copy. I love the cover. Yeah. yeah. I also got a net galley, uh, arc from, uh, of this and I haven't read it yet either, but I, I plan to read it this month. You know, it's one of my holiday books that I'm looking forward to. So, mm -hmm. okay. Great. Next pick. Ooh, I recognize this writer. Right. So this so. is The Wife the Wife Upstairs by Rachel Hawkins. And it's a thriller and it's an early release. And Kelly looked very excited when she saw this come up. Yes. Uh, this is apparently um, an updated Jane Eyre. Oh. oh. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay, so the 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 quick synopsis is just a twisty southern gothic about a rich husband, his hot young fiance, and unanswered questions about his missing wife. Oh, that is very Jane Eyre. Mhm. Mm cool. That sounds This good. one is this is definitely coming with me. <laughs> yeah. I this is a Kelly book if I ever saw one. For sure. <laughs> this is going to be know. one of those multiple book months, I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a big thriller reader, nor am I a big Southern Gothic reader. I do love Jane Eyre. So that is the one part of this that makes me think maybe I would read it. But I don't think I would do a book of the month. I might, you know, borrow it from Kelly at some point. Mm -hmm. You can do that. That's allowed. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm a hit or miss thriller person. So. Yeah. I usually like the thrillers that I do pick up. I'm just picky about which ones I pick up. So this might be one that I would read, but um, yeah, there's so many good picks already. I'm not sure if I would use it for my book of the month. We'll see. Yeah. Okay, fourth pick. Ah, oh, okay. This one looks interesting. It is a short story collection. I don't remember ever seeing a collection of short stories as book of the month. Neither have no, I. No, me either. So this is The Office of Historical Corrections by Danielle Evans, and it's a novella and stories. And it says, sharp, insightful, compulsively readable. This story collection cuts right to the heart of contemporary American life. I'm I'm in. I don't yeah. even need to see more than that. I would get this book. That sounds great. I've heard really good things, and it's been on my radar. But historically speaking, I'm not huge on short stories. Uh, so maybe we can do a swap for yeah. like this and wife upstairs. Great. Sounds good. Yeah, I, I I don't normally pick up short stories, but I don't dislike them. It's just never something that I think, oh, I'm going to pick up short stories, but they sound great. So yeah, we'll see. Yeah. All right, last pick. Hmm. All right. The last one is also a thriller. Um, People Like Her by Ellery Lord. Uh, warning, this addictive suspense about an influencer and one creepy follower might just make you swear off your phone. <laughs> yes. Wow. <laughs> that is mine. It's a debut and a early release. Whoa. I That's do not... love, I do love influencer cult culture. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it does sound like my type of thriller. Um, yeah. Sort of like a new take on domestic thriller, which are the thrillers I normally enjoy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Those are good picks. Good. It's a good month. Yeah. So many good choices. Okay. Of these books, what do you, what do we think we're going to get? Um, <sighs> I'm definitely doing the Rachel Hawkins and people like her. I'm probably doing uh, in a holidays as well. Wow. Uh, should we should we see what the add-ons are like? Just for oh, oh I forgot about the add-ons. I think okay. I think we should just stick to the top five. Yeah. I I, I want to read more about what this close to okay is about. Yeah. yeah. Me too. Okay. Quick take. A near trash. Oh, we already read that. Okay. Multiple viewpoints. Oh, neat. Sad. Okay. Mm. <laughs> Inspirational and literary. Mm. Um. So the reviewer is Bryn Greenwood, and she talks about why she loves it. It's no secret to say we are living in difficult times. And in a holiday season where so many of us are isolated from friends and family, I suspect many of us are yearning for a sense of connection. All right. So she's saying, like, this helps you kind of um, 
live vicariously through people who are, are connecting on a personal level. And it's not a, a typical love story, it says. So maybe it's more about friendship love, which would yeah. be a nice um, change from, you know, it's not like a yeah. typical romance. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't, I don't think I was right. I don't think it's about a um, organ donation. I don't know that I would get this, but it does look good. But I just yeah. feel like it's one of those books I would get and then it would sit on my shelf for a really long time. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah, it de- yeah, it definitely, I mean, there's some sad, th- it looks like um, trigger warning for suicidal ideation. Yeah. Um, yeah. It sounds like some sadness for sure, but like like the reviewer said, maybe um, some sense of hope. Yeah. So, well, it's not, it's, it's, it is a great pick for book of the month. I'm sure a lot of people will get it, but I think this, this, these are great picks. So I'm excited yeah. to, I think I'm going to get in a holidays and the short story collection, um, the office of historical corrections. Awesome. Yeah. And listeners, I, I was going to announce this, this episode anyway, I am officially going to stop my ban on buying <laughs> books because I want to get a book of the month this month. I'm not, I haven't decided yet. Maybe um, people like her. That sounds really interesting. And then if I get an add-on, which I don't think I will, but if I did, I might get this close to okay because I I am intrigued to read it. um, I don't mind sad books. I like a good cry, so. (laughs) Yeah, yes, that's true. Okay, so let's look really quick, really quickly at the add-ons. So where do I go for that? All books. All books, okay. So December, new recent add-ons. Mm. Oh. <gasps> okay, the add-ons are great. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got More Myself, a memoir by Alicia Keys, who I love. I love oh, her. Ready um, Player Two by Ernest Klein. Mm-hmm. Which I just read and loved. Oh, okay. Legend Born, what? Oh, that looks so good. By Tracy Dion. I've been wanting to read this. I want all the add-ons. Yes. Oh, what's Chicken Sisters? Oh, Chicken Sisters. Oh, dude, A Strange Sisters and Reality TV. I don't watch much reality TV, but if you give me a TV show set or a book set in reality TV, I'm like, yes. Wow. Oh God. Why can we only get three books? Okay, I'm this is bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, Frida oh. Dale. Oh, it's a biography of Frida Kahlo. Oh, that sounds so good. Oh, book of the month. You knocked this out of the park. Yep. Yes. Good job, book well of the month. done. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Great. Well, such okay. good picks, you guys. Um, mm-hmm. listeners, if you you know, love book, of, you know, if you haven't tried book of the month, we totally recommend. Yes. Yes. And you can use one of our codes. I'll link them in the show notes. Oh, we'll yeah. In the show notes. We'll so see who, yes. who, who everyone's favorite podcaster is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's a competition. <laughs> Close your eyes and point. <laughs> love it. Okay. So back to regularly scheduled programming. So we're going to talk about what we're reading this week. So Kelly, what are you reading? Uh, I'm actually reading one of my book of the month picks from earlier, uh, Valentine by Elizabeth Wetmore. Um, I found out that on the book of the month app, it will track and you have to read 12 books that you have purchased this year from them. Um, At least I think five genres and at least three debuts. And I've done, I think, seven genres. So that was well. And I've read 12 books, um, but only one debut. So this is uh, a second debut. Um, And it opens with a sexual assault on a teenage girl. And when I say teenage, I mean 14. And it is in a, a town in Texas. And every chapter is narrated by a woman. And it's the reaction to that event through their eyes. And oh, wow. some of them are some of them are really supportive and some of them are really kind of awful, but it affects everybody in this town. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's some racism too, because the teenage girl, her name's Gloria, 
um, she is Mexican and it's, it's so gross the way that people are reacting to it. Cause it, it's a lot of, well, you know how those, those kids are, they grow up so fast and it's Ugh. not like our 14 year old kids, mm-hmm. they're different. And it's, it's so good and so powerful and just depressing and infuriating. So I, I don't know that I can say, oh my God, everybody read this, but right. I'm so glad I am because it's great. I have that book. I haven't read it yet. <laughs> but it's I got good. Too. <laughs> I mean, I, I, think I, I think I would like to read it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Okay, Rachel, what are you reading? Uh, so my book slump is officially over. I've been reading nonstop. I'm on day four of a six day vacation and this is the fourth book I've wow. read so far this, this vacation. It's Station 11 by Emily St. John Mandel. And it's about, it's a post-apocalyptic book about, you know, um, this troupe of traveling, you know, uh, musicians and actors who, you know, travel in a caravan to different settlements 20 years after a pandemic wiped out 99% of the world population. It's really interesting. They just go town to town, you know, performing Shakespeare or music. It's so much fun. Um, And of course, very dark and sad because it's post-apocalyptic and we're in a pandemic right now. But um, I, I find it to be pretty uplifting so far, even with like, there's a bunch of like, dark mysterious things going on um I really enjoy the characters the writing style is beautiful and yeah looking forward to continuing with it I loved her writing when I read that as well I'm not a huge fan though of of post-apocalyptic plague ridden society (laughs) uh starting over except when you get to the part where they are rebuilding the civilization I do love those parts but so for that reason it wasn't my favorite book but she's a gorgeous writer and I would definitely read more of her books the thing I loved most about it because we we read it for our in real life book club I love that it's at the point where it's like well surviving isn't enough we need to do these things that actually make it a life worth having and a life worth living and it was just it was really beautiful I thought and I I loved it yeah yes I did love the focus on art and how art is important to life um it's sustaining it's life-giving I am currently reading two books. I am just started The Book of Two Ways, which is our book club book. So if you haven't started it yet, listeners, go ahead and, and start it so you can listen along to our episode next week. But I'm also listening to Promised Land by Barack Obama, President Barack Obama, president of my heart always. <laughs> and it's great. I mean, it's really long. So I'm about two thirds of the way through it, though. And it's just nice to listen to him narrate it. But I will say, it's kind of boring at parts. There are definitely some really boring parts where he goes on and on about TARP legislation and Mm. the financial crisis and healthcare reform. And honestly, I'm here for it. Bring back boring politics is what I say. (laughs) This is this is what politicians should talk about, right? Like the reason he's pre- he was president is because he's a nerd who likes to talk <laughs> about stuff like this. And that's who we want. We bring nerds back to the White House. And luckily yes. we are in January. Thank God. Yeah. So, <laughs> but, but for that reason, like I'm not that into, you know, the nitty gritty of policy. So sometimes I'm like, okay, can we move it along? Like get to the tea about Putin. But... <laughs> But honestly, I am loving it. And um, yeah, I definitely recommend everyone pick it up. And it's just volume one, too. I do think that he probably said no to his editor a lot. And I did hear something where he was giving an interview and he said that there was one part his editor recommended taking out. And he was like, no, I left it in. And okay, on the one hand, yes, you're Barack Obama. Do what you want. That's fine. I don't think that every writer has to take every suggestion their editor makes. Absolutely. It's a partnership. But on the other hand, listen to editors. Editors are important. They do good work. 
most people need editors to make their writing better. So I just thought that was funny. (laughs) They're good at what they do. There's a reason they have that job. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Okay. um, So we have book news now and somehow we really only have good news or at least not bad news. Um, first, in an update from last week, or I guess two weeks ago, because we, we didn't do this last week, mm-hmm. uh, the Romancing the Runoff auctions are over, and they've raised almost half a million dollars um, for the the runoff elections in Georgia in January. Um, it, it makes me so happy. Mm-hmm. I, I love everything about it. And um, they've said that going forward they're probably going to focus on local elections like down ballot stuff not necessarily things like this that well yes a local election would also dramatically affect what happens in the country but um they have said that when stacy abrams runs again they will do this again for for okay. her so that makes me really happy too and actually i guess i don't know if this is good news or not um it's definitely weird uh so several years ago we had the big six publishers and then penguin bought random house and so it went on to the big five and now we are down to the big four uh pending government approval penguin random house is going to buy simon and schuster which uh cbs and viacom have sold because they don't consider it one of their major assets Mm. so I don't know. Uh, what do what do we think about this? Well, like you said, it is pending government approval. I believe I read that they have to wait until, or they it will wait until Biden takes office um, before they decide. And that is typical. Like it takes a while for these things to get approved. Last year, there was a potential merger between two of the biggest college publishers, Cengage and McGraw Hill. Mm-hmm. And it threw everyone into a tizzy. It was like, oh my gosh. And then it didn't end up happening. It wasn't approved because that would be a huge mm-hmm. monopoly. Mm-hmm. They yeah. are t- the two top two and three college publishers. And it just would have been a huge um, thing for them to do that. And the government isn't going to, you know, they're very, they can be very strict about those things, which is a good thing. Like competition is good for, for mm-hmm. the mark for the economy. So I don't know if this will happen. These are two huge companies. Simon and Sue Schuster uh, publishes um, a ton of renowned and best-selling authors. I believe Stephen King is one of yes. their authors. Yes, he is. Uh, but it did make me think that the recent uh, dissolving of certain imprints that we heard about a few weeks ago might have been oh, a precursor yeah. to this. The Simon and Schuster. Um, YA imprint in particular so yeah so this is still remains to be seen but if it does happen a lot of people are going to lose their jobs and even if it doesn't they still might lose their jobs given the what this says about you know what Viacom thinks about the company right Mm -hmm. they probably if they if they can't sell it they'll likely downsize yep which is too bad yeah I mean just and it's Simon and Schuster which publishes Stephen King. And I know he's not like their only author. Right. But I mean, you have Stephen King. How is that not considered like an asset worth keeping? Mm. Because they're too big. This is what happens. These publishers get too big. They buy up all these imprints. So now we have a lot of little imprints or a lot of smaller publishers that have gone away that used to be part of the industry. They just got absorbed by places like Simon and Schuster, places like Penguin like and Random House. Um, and now Simon and Schuster can't market all these books. You know, you, you get too big at some point. That's the problem. So mm-hmm. I, w- I wish there was a way. Well, I wish people bought more books. I guess that would help <laughs> because then we can have more publishing houses. We can have smaller publishing houses, which would be good for authors. It would be good for people who work in the industry and it would just probably be probably be good for diversity you know more voices Mm -hmm. running these houses and making these editorial decisions so yeah it's just they're getting too big yeah 
<laughs> All right. Well, moving to our next segment, we are going old school and we are going to do our famous flagship segment, You Know What You Should Read. So Julia, why don't you go first and tell us what we should read? Okay, so since I'm reading Barack Obama's newest book, Promised Land, I think that you should read Dreams from My Father by Barack Obama, which is his first book that he wrote. And it is his memoir, of you know his early years and i read this back in 2008 when he was running for president the first time and i loved it it's much shorter than promised land so it won't take you long to read and he has an amazing life story i mean born to a white mom from kansas and a kenyan father and born in hawaii grew up in Hawaii and then moved to Indonesia when, with his mom and her second husband and his sister, Maya. So he's lived all over the world. Um, he wrote the book because he got the book deal after being named the first black editor of the Harvard Law Review. So he had a lot of name recognition. He was getting a lot of press and he got this book deal and he wrote this really great book. And it's really, I think it's really interesting because he wrote it before he was in office. So I feel a little bit like when I'm reading Promised Land, I feel like he's still a little bit, not that he's not saying what he thinks, but he's being very careful still with his words. Understandably, he would be probably crucified if he said what he really thinks about certain people. Mm. So he's just very diplomatic. He's a politician He and he's really good at that. But in this book, he kind of just lets it, it's like he lets loose a little. I mean, he talks about being a kid and his drug use when he was in high school, which isn't that, you know, scandalous or anything, but he's honest about it. And um, yeah, there's just a lot to that book that I really enjoyed. So I highly recommend it. Right. I've been wanting to read that. I yeah. That. Audio book. Do the audio. Okay. Kelly, what should we read? Uh, well, I I recently finished and loved Ready Player Two by Ernest Cline. Um, it took me a little bit to get into it, but once I did, I I really liked it. Um, a lot of really good references, like in the first one. I didn't reread Ready Player One, but because I I've kind of found that a lot of times if I do, and if the original thing that I loved is really front and center in my mind I may not like the sequel as much or the companion novel as much um but it was really fun and the other thing I read that I really enjoyed is uh Secret Santa by Andrew Schaefer um who has also written uh written the um the Joe Biden mystery series um, oh yes yeah. he's he's very fun and the buddy one, the buddy the buddy cop series with yes. Barack Obama and Joe Biden <laughs> <laughs> um I I tweeted at him like hey so what's gonna happen with this series now and he followed me on Twitter but he did not answer hmm. so I don't know I'm I'm guessing we're best friends now so I'll, I'll keep you guys posted <laughs> great well those all sound good um my pick today and I know Julia you and I have spoken about these but I can't remember if you read them or not um and Kelly I don't know if you've read them but even if you both have I'm still going to recommend it at least to our listeners so um it's the graphic memoir written by Raina Tella Teldramir Smile and also it's uh two companions Sisters and Guts so these are really cute graphic memoirs about her adolescent years. The first one, Smile, is all about um, when she uh, was in this freak accident where she fell down and like her two front teeth like were pushed back up into her gums and she spent the next few years getting tons of dental work and like braces and headgear and all this stuff to fix her Aww. smile. And just kind of her like living through that, being a teenager, and it's it's very cute, very sweet, um, just like so honest, and I love it so much. Um, there's like, <laughs> the, the, there's a funny thing in here about her wanting to get her ears pierced when she turns twelve, and her parents are like, "Oh, aren't you a little young for that?" And her mom's like, "You know, your 
ear piercings get infected, mind it. And she's like, well, mom, you pierced your ear with a needle and an ice cube. And her mom's like, oh yeah. <laughs> so it's just like cute little funny stories like that. And um, yeah, it just like, it's so, it's so good. And like guts, I like the most maybe is my favorite. It's about her battle with like anxiety induced IBS and just like growing up with all of that as well. And like going to therapy as a kid. And it's just like, I just love these books so much. And I love her drawing style. She's very talented. So if you like novels. Yep. And she's the illustrator for the babysitters club graphic novels. Some of them. The first few. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's Smile, Sisters, and Guts by Raina Teljamir. I haven't read them yet, but okay. they sound really cute. Okay, well, we are going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we are joined by friend of the pod, Becky Farr. And we are going to give you some tips on how to read more books and how to get out of a reading slump and get back on track. So stick around and we will be right back. Welcome back. And today we are joined by Becky Farrer, who has been on the podcast before. We had a, a great episode talking about Kindred by Octavia Butler. And now she's back to talk to us about how to read more books and, you know, how we how we end up reading so many books throughout the year. Hi, Becky. Hi, I feel very privileged and happy that my bribes have worked out. So I <laughs> Well, we're excited to have you back. Um, we had a great time with you on the last time you were on, and I think today is going to be such a great episode. So let's get down to it. Um, so how to read more books. Uh, first of all, the average American, according to several sources, the average American reads about 12 books per year. Now, probably our listenership might read more than that, just based on if you listen to podcasts about books. You probably are an avid reader, right? So let's, I'm curious um, how many books we all read. So Becky, what's your average? How many books a year do you read? Um, I think for the last number of years, I've averaged about, about 80, 75, 80. Um, I was kind of in the middle of grad school and some other things, but this year I'm doing really well and I've already topped 120. So I don't know what happened there, but um, so just generally in that, in that 80 to hundred range is where I usually find myself. Wow. That's a lot. Julia, what about you? Yeah. So I have only been tracking this since 2016. And I think before then I was probably closer. You might be surprised to hear this. I was probably closer to that 12 book a year average mm -hmm. because we had book club. And then I, I might have read like one other book a month, but because of grad school and work being so busy for so long, I wasn't back into reading the way I was like in high school and middle school when I would read, you know, a book a day. Um, but since 2016, I've done pretty well. And I actually was looking at my Goodreads challenges. I read about 30 books in 2016 and 2017. And then in 2018, something happened and I doubled it. And then I would average about 60 books a year. This year, I am already up to 71. So I'm already ahead of my average of 60, which was my average the past couple of years. Nice. So yeah, so I'm also doing well. I think it's because of the pandemic, just because I've had more time at home, um, less extracurricular activities, less time going out and doing things. So there's just been more time to read this year, which is probably why. Also this podcast, <laughs> <laughs> we started a books podcast. So it that's helps. probably, <laughs> yes, it does. Yeah. <laughs> What about you, Kelly? Um, I don't know how many books I've read this year. Um, I know that for the most part, um, the last maybe six or seven years. Okay, so this is going to make me sound like a complete weirdo, but I, I figure y'all know that anyway. Um, for most of the past like six, seven years, I read over 200 books a year. Mm. um a cup one year I read 300 and I think 68 yeah, um I've I've, 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 
<laughs> yeah, I, wow. I was on fire that year. Wow. Um, <laughs> Becky knows she was there. <laughs> I was there, yes. <laughs> you and all talk about it like in shame. <laughs> Y'all talk about it like it was like a war. Like I remember those days. <laughs> I mean, it kind of was. <laughs> when I when I realized in June that I had read, and I mean, I didn't finish a book every single day, but it averaged out that it looked like I had. Mm-hmm. And June, it became like, well, if I can do it for six months, I should be able to do it for 12. So it just became like, a battle of wills and I won. Challenge accepted. I won. <laughs> you did. <laughs> um, this year, because of the pandemic, I really have not been reading like I generally do. And I just decided like, I'm not going to keep track. I'll read what I read. If I don't want to read, I don't have to like, but yeah. Um, so I, I don't know how many I've read this year. I would go out on a limb and say it is not near 200 but I don't know. It's interesting that because of the pandemic, you feel like you've read less this year. And I feel like I've read more. I bet a lot of listeners can relate to both yeah. feelings. Yeah. It yeah. makes sense either way. You look yeah. Like- and uh, I think cyclically, it also has done that. Like, I remember there was a period of time where I just couldn't read anything. Yeah. And I just was like, nope, I can't. I, can't. I just, everything has to be mindless mind candy you can't do anything else and then it just kicked into high gear and I was like oh I I'm really finding myself in this place where I want to read so I think it's also not just the pandemic year I think the pandemic year has messed with the cycle of everything sure yeah good point um so I my I've definitely in my adult years since I started tracking on Goodreads which was 2014 was the first year I fully tracked what I was reading. Um, my, the first, like 2014, I read like 24 books. And then 2015, I read a little more, uh, maybe 30 something. And then 2016, I read almost 60. I think I read 50 something. And then 2017, I was like, whoa, I went way down to 27 again. Um, and I realized that was the year that like my health took a turn for the worst and I was battling um, chronic pain and, and insomnia and, and uh, my heart problems were getting worse. So I was just sick all the time. I was really depressed. So I didn't read much at all. 2018 through this year, I started reading a lot more. Like 2018, I read 80 something books. 2019, Last year was the year that I set a goal of 100 books and I read 119. So that was like my top year for sure. Definitely since I was a kid, like Julia, I would say high school and and all those kinds of years, I read a lot more. Um, But yeah, and so this year so far, I'm at 98. So I definitely will get over a hundred of a hundred. And I think the pandemic and the... um, because January, February, I think I read maybe five books between those two months. Um, but then starting in March, I was back up to 10 or more a month. So, yeah. I just realized something. 2018 was the year that you kicked your reading into high gear. And that's why I doubled my books that year because my sisterly competitive instinct kicked in when I realized how many books you were reading. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> like, well, like, I can't not read a lot of books if Rachel's reading a lot of books. Uh, that, so I mean, that's, that's not surprising at all to me. Like, I, I think that sometimes reading motivation comes from um, the people that we love and what they're doing. And, and yeah, it's just mm-hmm. fascinating to me that you do that. I'm just not surprised by that at all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love that. It's uh, actually funny you say that because uh, my friend Kathy, you, you guys know Kathy, she was on. Yeah. Um, we have this joke that I will agree to do something and I'll make like a list of the things I'm going to read or the things I'm going to watch. And then once I write it down, it's almost guaranteed that I'm not going to do it. But the exception was our fall reading challenge. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I am not going to be the only one on this podcast who doesn't win. <laughs> I'm an only child, so I, I really just have you guys to compete with. <laughs> also, well, I, I compete against the world in general, too, because I remember, um, do you remember the great reads that PBS did, the yes. 100 books, and they did that whole series? I was at an event for the singing group that I'm in, which plug for Songrise, it's DC's all-women social justice acapella group. 
Right. They're amazing. Um, yes. So anyway, we were at a gig and there was like a whole bunch of like other different things around. And there was a table from the Great Reads and the ladies are like, hey, have you heard of the Great Reads? And I'm like, yes, I have. And, and they said, well, have you read any of them? And I'm like, I, yeah, I've read some. And they're like, well, how many have you read? Well, I had done this calculation and I had read 68 and I had four of them on my to read list. And I was like, so annoyed with myself that I had only read 68 of this great 100 series. Like, I'm like, this is horrible. How could I have only read 68? So I'm like, very dejectedly, I said, yeah, no, I've like I've read 68. And the girl looks at me and she's like, and her partner's or her partner was like, I thought I was doing good with 35. And I was like, that is so relative, right? Because I was just like, I don't measure up. There are these hundred amazing books and I have not come anywhere close to finishing them. And the others are like, because so I think that's all relative. Like for some of us, 12 books may be like an amazing accomplishment. And for some of us, 12 books may be like January, right? Right. It's, it's right. All relative. But I always set myself up against the well, the standard is a hundred. Yeah. I'm, I don't yeah. measure up. <laughs> but I think that's, I think that's a good point. And by the way, I have this vision of you just like coming home after that conversation, just like closing the door and just like crying in shame. Cause like I've only <laughs> read 68. Only 68. <laughs> <laughs> but it's such a good point. And I do want to say, if you're listening and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I need to read more because of some of these high numbers. I don't think anyone, I think it's true. You should it's relative. Measure yourself against what your goals are or what you have time for, what your life allows for. You know, everyone's different. And this is not about like, this episode is not like how to read a hundred books in a year. It's just, if you want to increase the number of books that you're reading, these are some, you know, hopefully we can give you some tips and strategies for that. But yeah, it's mm -hmm. all relative. Exactly. exactly. Everybody has um, a different lifestyle and different responsibilities and, and just different things they enjoy doing. And you don't have to read a hundred books a year to call yourself a reader. Right. Mm -hmm. You read books, mm -hmm. you're a reader. Yeah, yeah. totally. Um, I read an article. I want to say last year, I don't think it was this year, but it was um, a woman who is a books editor for a magazine it might have been BuzzFeed's book editor. Um, I'll, I'll try and find it and put it in the show notes. But um, she said she always read over 400 books a year. And when people were like, how do you do this? She was like, well, reading is my job. Reading is what I do for fun. And I don't do anything else. And I read a lot because reading is most of what I do. Um, and yeah, like, while while Becky is singing and saving the world and while Julia is hiking for some reason, I don't even know. And Rachel's like doing things and going places and having fun. Um, I'm here reading and that doesn't make me better or more serious. It just makes me someone who does not want to go outside and be in nature <laughs> because it's gross. And that's where pollen lives. You know, you can, you can read outside. Too. That's where the <laughs> pollen is. <laughs> okay. No, it's true. If, yeah, if, if my job was reading books and I could spend six to eight hours a day reading books, that would be a book a day for me. Mm -hmm. I read for like sure. a page a minute. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, and I think that too, like I, I live downstairs to an amazing family with two young children and another on the way. I'm like, if I had, if they were comparing themselves to me, that's ridiculous. I have no children. I have no like familial responsibilities like right. that. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, we all have different spheres in life and that enables or doesn't enable the kind of time that you want to spend. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right. Um, so I think this is something we can all relate to that um, no matter how, you know, much we love reading, um, there's this thing called the reading slump that tends yeah. to happen. Uh, Julia, describe to us what a reading slump is. A reading slump is when you just, no matter how much you, how hard you try, you just can't get into that groove. And so you pick up a book, maybe you read a couple pages and then you put it down and go do something else. So you just can't get into reading. And 
days go by and you haven't finished a book, which might be abnormal for you. So I'm sort of in a tiny slump right now. Not really. I'm still reading, but I'm not reading as much as I normally would. Um, Like for example, this week I've been on vacation and I thought I was going to read a book a day like Rachel is right now, but instead I've finished one book and started another and that's fine. I've been doing a lot of cleaning (laughs) instead. I've been doing some hiking as Kelly mentioned. Um, (laughs) Yeah. A a reading slump is when you are not reading as much as you normally do. And so that's, again, like it's all relative. So whatever's normal for you, it's anything that is less than that. So it could be not reading at all or just not reading as much as you want to. Right. Yeah. I, I get into reading slumps. I probably have like two good reading slumps a year. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, this year I had one in, um, February, I finished zero books. I think I read five books in January and then it took me all of February to read one book, which I finished in like the first week of March. Um, and that's fine. You know, uh, sometimes we just don't feel like reading. And then I had one recently that I'm now out of. Um, but it, you know, it just, there, there can be a lot of different reasons for it. I think, um, Becky, do you, do you experience reading slumps? I do, I do. which is interesting because I, a lot of times just find myself in, um, like having reading be the escape and when it can no longer be the escape, like that just is like, it's just jarring. Mm -hmm. But I do get those times where I'm just like, I'm just not into this. I just don't feel any of this. I just can't focus. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Kelly, you mentioned you haven't been reading as much this year in general. Do you think you've been in a slump since COVID hit? Like just a time one? I I definitely have. Um, I don't really have the focus that I had before. Mm -hmm. So even if it's a book I love, I'm reading like maybe a chapter or two at a time. And then I am basically cycling between Twitter and Facebook and seeing what's going on and just like a little bit of doom scrolling, but also just like avoiding in general and trying to find like any sort of distraction that isn't that I am uh, I'm watching a lot of TV which I never really did before um it's it's weird and uh for me another part of a reading slump is when it's a book that I know generally I would absolutely love and just really get sucked into and never want to put down until I'm done um you know I I'm either taking forever to read it or I haven't read it like I still haven't read uh Darius the Great deserves better like oh wow I know like it it makes no sense I loved the house in the cerulean sea I have the extraordinaries I haven't read it yet um I haven't read 10 things I hate about pinky there are all these authors I love that have put out books and I'm just like I don't know I'll read it at some point it's, it's you will. weird and I don't like it. I do want to say though, it's okay to be in a reading slump. You will get out of it. And I think that's just something to keep in mind. You know, I, these happen to me all the time, but I don't stress out about it. It's like when you're in a really good long-term relationship and you just have a dry spell and you haven't, <laughs> you know, gotten down and dirty for a while. It's okay. It'll happen. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good, I like that analogy. So, it's, yeah. it's hard for me to to see that that way. Like I really resonate with that analogy. Um, but I, I think I find that um, books and me like have a very different sort of thing. Like um, my books are my sense of home, mm-hmm. uh, My where my bookshelf is the things that are on it can track the trajectory of my life. And like, I can point out things that I read as a child and where I was when I read it and why, like it, it becomes a sense of home to me as somebody who's moved a lot in my lifetime, like 28 times or something like that in my 47 years. Like it's just a long time. So when I get a reading slump like that, it's really hard not to um, have it be a blight against the core of who I am because like 
if you talk about Becky, Becky is a reader. It's like an identity thing. And when mm-hmm. something like a reading slump happens that I can't figure my way out of, it becomes an identity questioning thing. Like I've invested so much of this. I have books on my wall. I fill the bookshelf mm-hmm. with my dad. Like there's so many pieces to that, that if I stop being able to read, it begins to like crumble at what I, who I think I am. So I think sometimes that ends up being a little bit more difficult for me than just like, oh, it's a slump. But I think that same thing is true a little bit of relationships, because if you are like, we're together, that's, that's what we are. And then we're having this discord, like that still feels Mm. like it isn't like something in the core of us is not maybe right. That's true. And that goes back to the sense of home too, like that's how it feels with a relationship too. And it's interesting that you said that it's almost like you feel displaced when you're not reading Mm because that's home for you. But I do think like a good relationship or like a love of reading and being a reader, you do find your way back home. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Yeah. but I know it it is definitely hard if it goes on for a long time, even in either scenario. (laughs) (laughs) I, yeah, I, I, I can definitely resonate with that. And now I, all I can imagine is um, having a self-identity crisis because I'm not reading enough and then calling my therapist and being like, who am I? <laughs> <laughs> that's all I can think. I, I would tell that's something I would do. <laughs> Actually, it's funny you say that because when I first started going to therapy a few years ago, I did say that. I was in a, sl- a reading slump. Now that you say that, it, a lot was going on. I was oh my God, there was just a lot of things changing in my life. And I remember breaking down and, and saying like, I'm not, I'm, I'm not feeling like myself. I'm not even reading right now. And she said, yeah, it sounds like you're not living your best life. Aww. And that was like, like, yeah, like living your best life is finding joy in those little things. And for me, not that reading is a little thing, but it is mm-hmm. a thing I find joy in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I find one of one of the things that cause can cause a reading slump for me is if I'm reading a book that I'm not enjoying, but I don't realize I'm not enjoying it. I just, it's like, I won't pick it up. It's like, oh, uh, I'd rather do something else or I'd rather watch something on TV. And I don't realize in the back of my brain, I might know it, but like, you know, my, my just like consciousness is not like, oh, it's because I'm not enjoying the book. Um, now I find I've gotten better over the last couple of years at just not finishing books if I don't like it. So is that something that we all do? Um, Becky, do you, what we call DNF books, do not finish? So very, so that has changed for me. It it used to be, I could count on one hand, how many books I'd never finished. It was sort of very much like the it'll get better. Everybody likes this, but I've heard good things about, you know, I, I just need to plug on. I just need to like slog my way through it. Um, and it became that sort of like challenge. I will do this, right. Shall conquer this. Um, but I, in this last year, especially I've just been like, no, you know what, if I'm not feeling it, I can stop. Like I was even reading a book, um, listening to an audio book this week, uh, which I'm enjoying very much. But the main character was starting to do something that I was like, I can just see where this is going. And I can't deal with this right now, turning it off and was giving myself permission to do that rather than suffer through it in that moment where I couldn't. Um, So that has changed a lot for me. My my did not finish or will not finish shelf on Goodreads has like tripled in the last year. And I'm really pleased with myself for being like, nope. And there may be some that I'm like, I would like this if I was in a different frame of mind. So I actually have a will finish later shelf on Goodreads also, because I'm like, I'm going to put that aside for now, because right now I'm not in the frame of mind to do that. And I can't slog it through. But sometime, I think I may find this book fascinating. That's a good point. You know, if someone is um, weary of, you know, DNFing books because they don't want to feel like they didn't accomplish it. Um, you can put it in the try again later shelf. Um, so Kelly, do you DNF books? Um, I do, but very rarely. I have a really good sense of what I'm gonna at least like. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, there have definitely been books that I enjoyed, but maybe didn't like as much as I expected. Um, but you know, I just, 
usually I will only stop if it's like, I know this is a book that I will enjoy, but I'm not, I'm not ready for it right now for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Um, And I feel like that's one of the first clues that I'm in a reading slump when I try like what seems a lot of times like 10 or 11 books and I'll get like maybe a chapter into all of them and then it's like no 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 (laughs) um so that's that's my first really big clue um usually I finish though um Mm. just because I know I know my own taste pretty well Mm -hmm. and I don't set myself up for failure um I have one friend who is a book blogger and her, I don't understand her because it seems like every, every review, there's at least one book where it's like, I didn't think I'd like this and I didn't zero stars. And it's like, why would you, Hmm. why would you do that? Like, why would you read a book that you think you're going to hate? Like, I mean, there's stuff I would hate read, but that's generally somebody's Twitter feed. <laughs> you know, like I'm I'm not going to read 300 pages of something and it's like, I thought it would be trash and it is trash. Do not read this. And right. that I don't make, understand that. That doesn't make sense to me either. Like if you know going in, it's not going to be something you will like. Why do that to yourself? It's one thing to like start a book you think you're going to like and like by halfway through you're like I don't really love this but maybe it'll get better and you you finish it anyway but that's different because you went in with expectations that you would like it yeah Julia what do you think well I rarely dnf but the truth is I kind of do what Becky does and put it on the will read later pile Because saying I'm going to DNF it feels like making a firm decision. And you know how I feel about making decisions. I don't like it. (laughs) Oh, I will. There are a ton of books that I've started and never finished. And in my head, I'm like, oh, I'll read it eventually. Mm -hmm. Listeners, I will never read it eventually. That's the (laughs) honest truth. (laughs) So while I don't, there are two books I can think of in recent memory that I stopped reading and I do not intend to finish. It's Chemistry by Wakey Wang, I think is Wakey Wong. And I just didn't like it. And I didn't feel like continuing it. And I said, I'm not going to finish it. And then Sadie by Courtney Summers. I'm sorry, Kelly. I know you love that book. Um, It just wasn't for me. So I stopped reading it. I don't intend to pick it up again. I know Kelly's giving me the death stare right now. (laughs) It's one of her favorite books. And so I was dreading saying it, but Um, yeah, they're just not for me, but there's another thing that I have a big thing about and it's FOMO. Like if I start reading a book, especially one that's really popular and I'm not feeling it, I'll usually power through. And I've done that twice very recently. For instance, the seven husbands of Evelyn Hugo, I wasn't liking it at first, but I powered through because it's such a popular book. And I'm glad I did. I'm glad I finished it. I did end up enjoying it more than I thought I would after the first couple of chapters. So usually I'm happy that I power through, but I do kind of wish I was more like Becky and that I like freed myself from the need to keep going um, if I'm not really having a good time. Well, and if it makes you feel better, 47 and I just this year have allowed yeah. myself to do that. So. <laughs> I have so much to learn. <laughs> we all have our own journeys to, yes. to go on. <laughs> so we, I'd like to kind of um, give the readers some tips. So the, for the listeners at home, we're just going to kind of go around and first talk about, you know, what would be our number one tip for how to read more books in general, how to increase your reading. Um, and then also maybe a second tip on like how to specifically get out of a reading slump. So what would be your best way to get out of a reading slump? Um, so first generally how to read more and then, um, how to get out of slump. So Becky, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, I think, um, oh, I have so many tips. This is just ridiculous. Oh, sorry. I'm kicking my stand with my phone on it. So I'm going all jiggly for a minute. Um, <laughs> I think the first thing that I would just definitely say is very similar to what Kelly said earlier. Kelly said, I 
pretty much have a good sense of what I like and that's what I go for. Um, I just recommend people do some of that. If you know what you like, embrace it and go for it, right? Um, I, I think that sometimes we feel like we should read this or we should read that. Everybody's talking about this book and we should read this. Like, I think there were some that were just really big for a while that are like sort of angsty drama relationship novels that were just such such a big thing like with a little mystery in it like little fires everywhere or you know big little lies like so, there's so many things like that that just were like big and those are just not my genre at all like I I lean more towards sci-fi and fantasy I like epics I love um, intrigue, but I just sometimes interpersonal relationships with people who are self-absorbed or um, just not seeing things. I just, just, I just don't want to get into those weeds. And um, so I read a very minimum of those books. I read them occasionally, but it's easy to be like, oh, because everybody's talking about it. And now there's a TV series about it. And I should read this book. No, nah, that's not your thing. Don't do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Read more when you're like, you know, right now, I just really want a fluffy brain candy romance novel. Mm -hmm. Read it. Enjoy it. That's what you should do. Uh, yeah. If you want to read more, find the thing you love and dive in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because if you're reading what you love, you're going to want to read more. Mm -hmm. You're yeah. going to mm -hmm. choose that over another activity you could be doing. Absolutely. I love that. Um. What would be your tip for getting out of a slump? Same kind of idea or? I, I'm a huge fan of book polygamy. Um, so I never have just one book going at any time. I generally have several. Um, sometimes I feel like when I'm in a slump, it's because I just can't focus on one thing. Um, and so being able to have something readily at my fingertips to go somewhere else, like maybe I can't focus on the really deep anti-racist book that I'm reading right now, I may need to just do something that's a little more um, fantasy driven or um, something that is, is based in a world that I can get away into rather than the world that is right now. Like having that is really great. And sometimes they just really feed off of each other and inform each other. Like I remember one time I was reading about six books at one time and that included ta Coates is Between the World and Me and Roxanne Gay's Hunger and Exit Pursued by a Bear and um, I think uh, A Long Way to a, a, a Small, Angry, small and Planet. Angry Planet. And all of those had different facets on body and ownership and being seen and what you, and like the way those, oh, and I read, I think I read the book Younger in the middle of that too, like the book that the TV series is based on. And all of those, like informed each other in just the most beautiful way. So I sometimes think like getting out of a slump means allowing yourself to hop between different things when the mood strikes you, when it strikes you. So when you get in the mood to read, you don't be like, I have to go back to that book that I was reading. I have options and then I can see how these all play together and facet off each other and are, and are um, interesting. Um, so that's my biggest thing is to have options you don't have to be a polygamist like me. <laughs> you don't have to do that. You don't have to be reading I five books at the term. same time. Yeah. yeah love but, that um, <laughs> but you can just have options and just know like if, if I need to, I just need this fluff and I can jump to that and then come back to this thing that I'm reading that's something else. Mm -hmm. I like that. Having op your options open and not having to finish, even if you're in a slump, even if you're liking what you're reading, um, just pick up something else anyway in the meantime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Julia, what would be your number one tips for reading more and getting out of slump? Okay. My number one tip for reading more is remember that your phone is a Kindle yes. or a Kobo or a Nook or whatever vendor you want to buy eBooks from or get books from the library. You can get eBooks from the library and have them sent to your Kindle or just read them on your phone. So this way you can always have a book on you, even if you forget to grab a book on your way out the door. So if you are waiting in the doctor's office, or if you are in a really long line 
uh, getting your flu shot <laughs> you know, <laughs> or get, or in the grocery store or whatever. I, I said flu shot because my hospital has like a drive through flu oh. <laughs> and I waited for 45 minutes to get my flu shot in my car and I just brought, got out my phone and read my book. So one thing that I will do sometimes is if I'm reading a book in hard copy, I can find it on ebook from my library and then I can find my place and just keep reading if I'm out and about and I didn't bring my book with me, but I have, you know, 20 minutes to kill and Mm -hmm. I'm able to get through books a little more quickly that way. So that's my number one tip is uh, use your phone as a Kindle, or if you have a Kindle, just bring it with you. Um, but yeah, use eBooks um, and you can always have a book with you. And then my number one tip for getting out of a reading slump is to reread a favorite book. So if you are in a slump and you just can't get back into reading, pick up a book that you think about all the time, or is that you know, a favorite book from childhood or just one of the favorite books you've read ever and reread it. And you will have such a great time and it'll just get you back into the groove. Mm. One of my, um, one of the most problematic authors I've ever read said something very profound about that. Um, He said that uh, the true book isn't, it isn't the words that he put on the page. It's the intersection of what he wrote and who you are with your experience, your thoughts, your dreams, your feelings, like that nexus is where the true book lies. And Mm -hmm. that in that sense, it's infinite because every time you read that book, you will be a different person, even though you're still you. Mm -hmm. So what you see is something different and a new facet and a new experience. So it's simultaneously the nostalgia of coming home, but the seeing of something new in a new light. And I find that to be so profound and so true. Like many times as I've read Persuasion or The Secret Garden or uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder, like every time I read those books that have been home at one point in time in life, like as I change and I grow, that story becomes infinite. It becomes something so much more than it was the last time. I love that idea of going back and revisiting a classic. But in that way, you can also see who you've become and how you've grown because your lens for seeing it has changed. Nice. Yeah, that's beautiful. Kelly, what are your tips? Listen to Becky. (laughs) (laughs) Do everything Becky says. Yes, that is is true for this podcast and life in general. Just what did Becky say? Do that. I love it. So you're Um. seconding her. (laughs) Um... I would say, uh, and I I said this a little bit earlier too, but like the way to read more is to read more. Um, Mm. Like like Becky, one of the ways, probably the first way I would define myself is as a reader. Um, And then I, I sort of think, okay, well, if I'm a reader, you like, how am I, how am I actually making that true or not making it true? So if, if I'm a reader, but I'm not reading, I'm, you know, playing games on my phone. And I mean, it's fine. Playing games on your phone is not a referendum on your worth as a human being. But, you know, if, if I'm going to say I'm a reader, I need to make that my priority. Hmm. Um, and like, like Becky did say, if the books that everybody seems to be talking about are not books that you would enjoy, yeah, like, you're not five, you don't need to eat your broccoli before you can get dessert. Mm -hmm. You can just read what you want, you don't have to earn it. You don't have to trick somebody into letting you have it. You're you're a grown up, do what you want, read what you want. I Um, I feel like I want that on a t-shirt. You're not five, you don't have to (laughs) eat your broccoli before you have dessert. (laughs) (laughs) love it merch dream is coming true you guys I feel it yeah <laughs> you're just... not five read what you want yeah <laughs> um but I do think sometimes it helps me to branch out so maybe instead of reading something that everybody's talking about that still doesn't seem like it is for you 
talk to somebody who does like that, but who also knows you and your taste and can give you sort of a gateway into it. Mm. Um, so that that is what I would do for that. Um, and then the exact opposite of that is what I usually do to get out of a slump, which is give myself permission to not read. Like if I want to, if I want to rewatch Breaking Bad, for example, and that's what I want to do and I don't want to read, awesome, do that. Um, or what I, and rereading was one of my, my other tips. So I co-signed that with Julia, but um, reading something short, like a graphic novel or a book of essays, you know, like that can be a really good way because just getting through something, and I, that sounds awful saying that about a hobby that I actually really love, but sometimes you do. Sometimes if you can just be like, okay, I, I completed a book. I don't have the yips anymore. Maybe now I can uh, go to something else. The yips. Um, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I felt that way about Murderbot. Like I first read the first Murderbot. It's their novellas. And so they're super short. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so great. I just tore through this and I'm done. I'm going to read the next one. And before I know it, I like read four books in a week, but they were all like super short and they were all delightful. And it kind of spurs you on to, okay, what's next? Like you get excited because yeah. you're on a roll. Right. I love that. Um, Kelly, I, I love all of your tips. Like I was just thinking that giving yourself permission not to read, it's like it takes the pressure off. So it doesn't feel like, um, oh, I should be reading, I should be reading, because as we know, we are the podcast that shoulds all over our books. We do. So, <laughs> you know, sometimes when you're shooting that much, it just, it, it, it makes it feel like homework or like something you have to do. And like you said, Kelly, you're not five, you're a grown up, mm -hmm. you don't have to read. So if you take that pressure off, then you kind of give yourself that headspace to like, oh, this is what I want to do. Yeah. I, that happened to me the other day. I was like, oh, I should read the book of two ways right now, but no, I want to watch the princess switch switched again on Netflix. <laughs> and in that moment, I gave myself permission and I said, no, this is what I want to do right now. I'm going to watch it and I'll read my book later. And that's what I did. And it was yeah. great. Yeah. Your book will always be there for you. Yeah. 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 I also love reading. A, I had, gra I had read a graphic novel or a comic book or something short as well as one of my get out of a slump tips. Like you don't have to read the sacred history to like get out of a slump. No, <laughs> Just right. Read you should though. It's great. <laughs> you should, but it's really long. Yeah. Um, and read something that's going to take an hour or two. And then you've read a book and you're out of a slump just like that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. It's like, um, it's, it's the snowball theory of paying off debt. You know, even mm -hmm. if your smallest debt is a $50 credit card bill, pay that one off first. And then you're like, wow, I'm, I'm getting out of debt. Look at that. I already paid off a whole thing. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it gives you confidence. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so my number one tip for reading more in general is, um, Try reading things in a different format. So like Julia mentioned with the eBooks. So if you're not generally someone who uses an e-reader, try it out because it might be something new for you. Like for me, getting an e-reader did increase my reading because for a while, like reading at night was kind of like, how do I do this reading before bed? Because I've got the light on, but I have, a, you know, my husband's trying to sleep and I don't want to disturb him. And I'm like, well, an e-reader is very little light. It doesn't disturb him at all. So it's easier for me to read more if I'm not yet ready to fall asleep. Um, and then also my reading really kicked up a notch when I started listening to audiobooks. Um, and I know some people don't like audiobooks because it kind of, um, they, they, they feel like they get distracted too much. Um, for me, it's just a nice background noise um, when I'm doing something mundane, like chores, like, you know, washing the dishes, or if I'm doing some sort of craft that doesn't require a lot of brain power, like coloring or something like that, or um, bullet journaling. Um, if you're like a knitter or crocheter, and you usually like you know, yeah, they're like Becky, you could listen to an audiobook while you're doing that thing. 
Um, if you're just following a pattern, you know, and then you can kind of split your brain between the audiobook and whatever craft you're working on. Um, so that would be my biggest tip is, um, you know, find different ways to consume books. I, I would totally echo that audiobook. I um, have done a lot of audiobooks. They're also really good for commutes. Um, mm -hmm being able to listen while you're on Metro or even driving. Um, generally, my books travel with me like that. Um, they're great for airplane rides when you have to go across oceans. But I've also found that they are very good for me for when I'm trying to wind down to go to bed. Um, mm -hmm. Audiobooks and that sleep timer <laughs> are really yeah. helpful yeah. to keep my brain occupied enough to let my body relax, mm -hmm. but yet my eyes aren't involved because if my eyes are involved, I'm going to be up till 4 a.m. reading that book, right? Uh, right. So um, I, I just have appreciated them so much. And you can also get them for free from the library and mm -hmm. they go on all your devices. So absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I actually just bought a sleep mask that has built in headphones so that I can put it on, black out my world, and put my sleep timer on and listen to a podcast or an audiobook. And I put it on like 15 minutes usually because um, if I'm t tired enough, I, that's about what it takes for me to fall asleep, 15 to 20 minutes. Um, so I echo that, the sleeping thing. <laughs> yeah, I love audiobooks. I co-sign that for sure. When I'm doing chores, I'm always listening to something. Sam. And my, my love for that start. I'm sorry, I'm cutting you off, Rachel. That's okay. Go ahead. I was going to say my love for audiobooks started because my dad used to read to us every night Aww. and he read through like the Chronicles of Narnia. He did all the Lord of the Rings to us as kids. Like we'd all gather in my brother's room. My brother would be in bed and my dad would read a chapter and it would be Aww. like one more chapter, dad. No, no, it's time to go to bed, but just one more piece. Cause you know, battle of Elm's Deep and you know, all that stuff is <laughs> happening. And he would read us on car rides. We'd, we'd be reading and we'd always want my mom to drive because my dad could do all the voices. So we Aww. fell in love with that from an early age. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I, I think um, it's great to listen to a story like that, especially um, something that's either like read by the author, like a memoir read by the person who wrote the memoir, I think is really cool because it's just them telling you your, their life story or um, what we call full cast audiobooks. So like um, where there's different people that are reading the voices for different characters and their sound effects and like it's such a theatrical production I love those kinds mm -hmm. of audiobooks as mm -hmm. well so my number one tip for getting out of a reading slump is to like dive into the world of booktube or book podcasts because and that's not just a read listen to our podcast every week commercial <laughs> That's a but good I, one, though. Yeah. yeah. I definitely re started reading more after I started following people on YouTube who, do, who were doing videos about books. Um, you know, I followed a lot of um, booktubers in my time, and there's the videos I love the most are reading vlogs where they're just like vlogging a weekend or a day or a week where they're just like this is what I'm reading and they're talking about what they're reading and they show themselves reading and I don't know why I love that I think it's just really fun and it's sort of inspiring like wow look how many books they read in that one weekend I bet I could do that um so it makes me <laughs> want to read more um or if they do like a you know a book haul where they you know talk about all the books they've receive that month and you're like oh that looks good that looks good because they're describing it so I think um that plus podcasts that recommend books where you know the podcaster will describe what the book is and why they think someone would like it and that also is a way for for me to be like oh maybe I would like that I should pick it up and that I think is a good way to get out of a slump because it's just like you might be looking at your shelves and being like, uh, oh, nothing looks good. So it might just be like, oh, I heard about this on a podcast. I'm going to see if my library has it. Or yeah. Something. Fun fact. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of the books that I've read this year were recommended on this very podcast. Oh, that's great. Makes me happy. Me too. We're influencing people. <laughs> we are influencers. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. which you which recommendations like, did you like the most and were they mine 
That is a very good question. I'll have to go back and look at my Goodreads thing because I don't know that I could pull them all up. But yes, I <laughs> Any- did enjoy You Can See Me in a Crown. Aw, I love you so much. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great one. <sighs> what are some other tips we all have for either reading more or um, getting out of a slump? Julia, I know you had one. Yeah, so I was thinking a good way to get out of a slump would be to read some fan fiction, if that's something that you like, or if there's a series or world that you're a big fan of. Like, I read Harry Potter fan fictions still, and bonus, you can revisit the world of Harry Potter without uh, revisiting J.K. Rowling, because it's not written by her, it's written by a fan like you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like that will kind of get get me going again. Um, So if you love Star Trek or... uh, uh, Gilmore Girls or whatever. Literally, there's fan fiction for everything. So no matter what you're a fan really of, is. find find some fan fiction and just kind of it's brain candy. It's fun. It's silly a lot of times, and yeah, it's not like you're reading a whole book. You're just gonna sit down and write some story that someone wrote. So mm-hmm. that's a tip. What other recommendations do we have for the listeners at home who want to read more or need to get out of slump? Either one. So I recommend gimmick books. Um, So there are like a whole bunch of different ways that this can go. Like I remember hearing about a book on NPR where the author wrote the book and in the margins of the book, he had all these illustrations of the maps that the main character drew. I remember being so fascinated by it. And I, I went and I found it at Barnes and Noble at the time. And it was also... $38 $38 in the hardback. And I'm like, I'm not spending $38 on a writer I've never heard of before, right? <laughs> it's just not happening for me. So I started reading it. And three hours later, my cell phone beeped. And I realized I was still standing in front of the display in Barnes and Noble reading this book. And I was like, well, I guess I'm going to buy it, right? Um, but I was so fascinated by the gimmick of the stuff on the page. Or like S that J.J. Abrams co-wrote with someone that had like paper napkins and code breaking and conversations that happened in the margin of this book because the basic story is this book had been passed back and forth through a library by two different people who were trying to solve a mystery about the author but it was fascinating like I was like I can't wait for the next thing that's going to show up like a newspaper clipping is going to be between the page or um like Lincoln and the Bardo, the audiobook said it's got 134 narrators and like 134 narrators. Like, how is that going to work? Right. <laughs> but I was, I was there for the, like, I don't know how this is going to work, but I'm going to see. Um, and that gimmick just like sucked me in and I was so there for it. So I think even, even that can happen with like a, well, I know that this celebrity author is only writing this because such and such or whatever, like, give into the gimmick, just enjoy for a moment that you're getting inside. Um, you know, Lauren Graham is writing a book mostly about her time on, on Gilmore Girls or Carrie Elwes is, is writing all about his experience on Princess Bride. Like, you know, that's like a moneymaker, but also just enjoy yeah. it. Like you're sharing in this moment. So I'm always like, you don't have to always read the series, go for the gimmick, go for the thing that's makes your brain go ooh, I wonder right yeah I love that that's great well I think we've had a really great conversation um about how to read more and and I know I've got some new tips yeah (laughs) thank you all um Becky thanks for joining us is there absolutely yeah is there a book you want to tell us what to read today (laughs) I do I have several um uh, first first of all um for for uh uh julia i just read devolution by max brooks which is he wrote world war z which was this fascinating like um post-mortem on the zombie apocalypse and Mm -hmm. how people in our world responded um and it just was a, a biting social commentary well devolution is about a community in on mount rainier and there is, they are working to be like as a tech, 
technically advanced as possible, but be as connected to nature and like the smallest footprint as possible. Mm -hmm. And the audiobook is mostly narrated by Julia Greer, but or Julie Greer, but also Nathan Fillion shows up, Terry Ooh. Gross shows up. Like, oh, uh, yeah, there are just some amazing names, and it's it's just it's just so good. But um, this community, there was an eruption of the of the volcano, and their exit out of the community is like to get it back into civilization can't happen. So here's snippets of things like riots in Seattle and, and Portland because like harbors are cut off and like, you know, just massive, like massive um, thing. But at the whole time they are cut off, they're starting to notice that there might be Bigfoot in the hills, which sounds ridiculous, but it is like a horror novel because they're being stalked by this tribe of primates that is like, it's just, it's, it's insane. So it's both like the collapse of a small community and the journey to like discovering and where this might've come from. So yeah, you're holding it up on your thing. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I just found it on Libby. I'm going to put the audiobook yeah. on hold. Thank you. It is, it is so good. And mm. also um, uh, again, social commentary, but also, it has this guise of research and it has like a horror bent so it's a lot of fun so that's that's what I recommend for you thank uh, you Rachel um this was one of the books that I enjoyed the most over the last like I don't know it's like Sex and Vanity by uh Kevin Kwan he's the one who wrote the Crazy Rich Asian series um I didn't know what this was when I got it and then I started reading and I was just so delighted but one of my favorite books of all time and literally my favorite movie of all time is A Room with a View um yeah uh, which you should maggie smith helena bonham uh, carter when she was young yeah. and innocent uh i just it's just a delight uh um and this book is a modern retelling of that and i didn't realize until i was like part like beginning of the way through that i was like this is a room with a view oh my gosh and i <laughs> loved every minute so I know that you, you know, you guys had that whole episode of like Pride and Prejudice or, or Jane Austen retellings. This is like that only it's Ian Forrester retellings. And oh. I think it was a delight. I think you I had no that. idea. It's, I had it's no idea. Frothy, but it's delicious. <laughs> that sounds great. And I loved Crazy Rich Agents. So I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yay. Exactly. Thank you. And, and Kelly, um, I, I have three sort of children adjacent books for you, which sounds really weird um but I have some friends who um started a publishing company called Lola and Pear and they write and illustrate their own books and so they have three books um one is called Mommy Didn't Say That including Mommy Didn't Say That Mommy Said Tuck You like <laughs> Tuck You Into Bed because if you drive like that you should take a nap <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's delightful uh my friend John Paul uh, who helped me with the book wall behind me illustrated that and it is it's just lovely and they also did two others that are dog related um Aww. the adventures of duke the therapy dog and rosie to the rescue and both of those are dogs that were rescued and then came into homes and changed people's lives uh and rosie to the rescue 20 percent of the prof profits go to Pitbull rescues and 20% of the profits for Duke go to the shelter that he was gotten from. So both of them are delightful. And I actually know both of these dogs in real life. Um, sadly, Duke is no longer with us, but uh, Rosie is, and she is a splendid delight and delivered that book to me yesterday, which was very nice. But, <laughs> um, so I highly recommend they're delicious. They're fun. And they are good gifts for the kids in your world and the parents of kids in your world. So. Nice. And also guaranteed to get you out of reading slumps because they're so short. Great. They well, all sound so good. They do, <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you uh, for joining us, Becky. Yes. my. This was so fun. Mm -hmm. Anytime, uh, literally. <laughs> yes, we'll have you back again for sure. <laughs> All right. So thank you all for listening. Um, please follow our podcast on social media at WYSR underscore podcast on Instagram and on Twitter. You can email us at what you should read podcast at gmail.com. Find us on Goodreads at what you should read podcast and give us a rating and a review. And now you know what you should read. You're welcome. Yeah.